this as the global economic recession continues to wreak havoc in the South African economy. Government's 2.4 billion rand training layoff scheme to counter retrenchments kicks off next month. The scheme is a crucial component of a plan by government and its social partners to respond to the impact of the recession. Since 2008, the world has been rocked by the severest economic crisis since 1929. At the time, the ILO predicted a global loss of 50 million jobs. In South Africa, the global economic crisis has resulted in the loss of 1 million jobs in just over one year. Greece, on the verge of bankruptcy, now needs a $143 billion bailout. Spain and Portugal may follow soon. During situations of crisis, it is not those capitalist bosses and their governments that pay the price, but the ordinary people, the working class. South Africa is now the most unequal society in the world, and more than half its people live in poverty. Since 1994, government economic policies have encouraged extreme capitalist wealth accumulation. South Africa's company directors' salaries are amongst the highest in the world, and they often give themselves huge salary increases of over 50%. All over South Africa, working class people are angry, struggling for decent wages and service delivery. Two-thirds of, of the people in, uh, in VW were subjected and put on into the labor pool. It started off in uh, the United States, and there the impact has been devastating. We've, we've seen massive declines in the GDP. The manufacturing sector have been taking a serious pounding. In the first quarter of this year, the economy contracted by 6.4%. In the second quarter it contracted by 3%, uh, particularly affecting uh, the manufacturing and mining. But there's something happening uh, in, in the townships, it, and, uh, and which, which is reflected by just the number of uh, protests that is uh, recorded by the police. And I think that the police will tell you that uh, the numbers of protests is just tripling. They reflect the fact that the economy has not worked for ordinary people, have not been transformed and that we inherited this apartheid uh, economy. We have lost um, uh, about 48,000 workers in the mining industry and mining construction between December 2008 and end of June uh, 2009. It has affected, you know, number of companies at uh, this economic crisis. We got companies here that have closed and uh, we got uh, workers or companies that have subjected workers on perpetual short times and layoffs. And uh, many workers have been retrenched. They have been, they lost their own jobs. It was not my, me I, I alone who was subjected into these uh, work cuts, you know. It, it made me to feel, uh, firstly, insecure, secondly, you know, it demoralized me in one way or another mm. because it, when I look, I sit at home and look at my kids, you know, I could see that there's a problem here. And uh, even that fatherhood, you know, uh, 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 mood was not there at all times. The people who are paying for the crisis are not the capitalists um, because they are getting bailed out. The banks have been bailed out. That money is going to have to be found from somewhere and it's, the, it's workers who will pay for this crisis, although it's not of their doing. Comrades, over the past five years, all the construction companies have been making 
profits, which runs into 999%. We know that they don't feel no recession. The only people who feel a recession is the workers. One person who is employed by any company uh, is supporting not less than 10 family members. I did work here for six years and was retrained. It was the sadness day on, on, on last year, but I have to take the retrenchment because there was no other way. It's hard if you're not working when you're unemployed to put food on the table with the prices increase nowadays. And for me as a mother, and to look after my parents as well, I that struggle about that own. You have kids, you, you, they are using transport, and when they are going to school in the morning, they wake you up, Mommy, where is the bus fare? Where are you going to say, where is the bus fare? Not earning nothing. Petrol prices are very much, you know, unbearable in these days, because it is uh, rising every year. The train, prices were increased, taxis, a bus, you know, even water. They are increasing now, the electricity were increasing. I, I had to rent out my house even to actually, you know, survive because I had to move back to my parents because where am I, get, where am I going to get the money from to actually pay the bond? When there is no, nothing in the house and they're suffering, the girls think the only way to help our parents or our grannies is to go out for prostitution. Nowadays they don't even worry if they get money, just as long as they get a bag of food just to bring home, then they sell their bodies for that. That's what the young girls do nowadays. There's very little sign of relief for the already bad conditions and they're likely to get worse in the coming period. The executive of WBHO gave himself a 55% increase. 57 million in 2008. Now comrades, what is 13% on poverty wages? They've only been one class victim of that reconciliation, and that's the working class. All the others have gained, they've moved out of the townships, they've moved into the suburbs, they got better jobs, some have become capitalists, etc. Whereas the working class doesn't have the option to escape. It, it lives out its class condition. Everywhere else in the country there is a xenophobic attack. The working class is basically at each other's throat in some parts of South Africa. And, and they, 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 none of them are thinking about what is the core problem of why all of us are finding uh, ourselves in this, in this situation of being forced to leave families. The current global crisis is an outcome of failed solutions to previous economic crises, especially the capitalist crisis of the late 1960s and 70s. This is when the neoliberal offensive against the working class started. The key feature of this policy is to increase company profits. This is done in three ways, by decreasing taxation for the rich, which in turn leads to cuts in public service delivery, by decreasing wages, and through privatization, turning everything, including water, public transport, electricity supply, culture, and air, into something that can be sold by capitalists for profits. Capitalism is a system which is not able to, to grow and develop without confronting periodic crises. There are so many ways in which the um, stupidity of the earlier government in going for export-oriented growth, financialization and liberalization have put too many jobs at risk. The free inflow and outflow of finance, as we saw in 1997-98 in Asia, actually led to huge crises because um, basically you had short-term capital flowing in. And short-term capital, just as it flows in, can also flow out, and particularly when it is managed by people who know very little about your economy. They can actually endanger your economy quite massively as poor Indonesians or Thai people and even a massive and very sophisticated economy like Korea found out in 1997-98. Companies, therefore, become more productive and awash with profits. Finally, facing the threat of producing more than can be sold, capitalists tend to invest less of their increasing profits in production, switching to investing in the globalised financial markets instead 
in search of profits from interests on loans and speculation. The financial system is thus drenched in money. For the captains of interest, the big question becomes how to continue selling into saturated markets, or, put another way, how to sell to impoverished consumers made poor through neoliberalism. The financial system kicked in and gave loans and credit to working class and poor people. The problem of overproduction was solved for a while, but paved the way for the big collapse later. Last year, we experienced our first recession in 17 years. The crisis cost our economy about 900,000 jobs. Many of those who lost their jobs were the breadwinners in poor families. Yeah, the uh, crisis that we're seeing in South Africa now indicates a deeper crisis because since the early 70s, we've had a steadily declining per person output. So that's a deep-seated indicator that for about 30 years, this economy hasn't been working very well. Now we're in a position where it's absolutely a meltdown, and a meltdown of industry, but also the biggest problem, which led The Economist magazine to call South Africa the riskiest emerging market, is that the money's flying out. Money from here in Johannesburg and these wealthy bourgeois zones doesn't really stay here. It looks like it does because of all the uh, transparent hedonistic wealth. But actually, it's, fl it's flooding out to London or Melbourne in the case of BHP Bulletin. The biggest companies, Anglo, De Beers, Old Mutual, Investec, uh, Didata, SAB, right? All of those huge companies moved to London. So our crisis is, in fact, amplified by the fact that money is going out. South Africa's liberation had to be or was tied to neoliberalism in a very intimate way simply because the understanding was, the understanding between the, the white capitalists and the emerging, the ANC, became that the white capitalists would agree to you know, what was going to happen to the transition, provided that the ANC agreed to open up the economy so that white capital would always have the option to leave. As much as 23% of South Africa's wealth went abroad in 2007, According to research from the Corporate Strategy and Industrial Development Program at Wits University, these outflows amounted to more than 450 billion rand that could have been used for domestic investment, job creation and economic development. To cover that outflow, the South African government under Thabo Mbeki and now even Jacob Zuma is borrowing like crazy. Foreign debt has gone up to nearly $80 billion, starting with Mandela at about $25 billion foreign debt now up to about 80. And that means that we're borrowing from abroad, which our kids will have to pay back, making our capitalist crisis worse than it should be. If you plot those countries which have the largest welfare states against those who have the greatest government debts, yeah. the countries with the biggest debts are those with the smallest welfare states. Government that includes the whole of cabinet is fully behind a policy and approach which ensures that we don't overborrow we don't overspend, and that we follow a sustainable fiscal path. Starting in the USA, this policy led to banks crashing when workers and the middle class could not pay back their loans to the banks. The crisis soon spread to Europe. Governments stepped in and bailed out the banks and finance houses with tax money. But this could not prevent the entire credit system from freezing and setting off crises in other parts of the financial system. Companies needing credit for production cut back dramatically, precipitating a global recession and causing millions of job losses in most parts of the world, including over a million jobs lost in South Africa. If you remember, the then Minister of Finance he actually said, look, um, this was just going to bypass us and there was, South Africa was insulated to this particular global crisis. Fellow South Africans, our response to the challenge before us builds on policies that we have consistently pursued over the past decade and a half. Sound prudential regulation of the financial sector and a strong emphasis of, on the provision of public goods by government. 
the whole nonsense that has been pushed by them for so many years, that we could stay um, very solid economic policies that have stabilized the macroeconomic, frame, the macroeconomic space and everything else. But I mean, we knew that this was a complete lie. In the US and Europe, the governments responded by arranging huge financial bailouts and pumping billions of dollars into the ailing banks. These governments used people's tax money to support the monopoly capitalists. The US government rolled out a $700 billion bailout plan. Germany has been forced to nationalize some of its hardest hit banks. The South African government has established a 6.1 billion rand package for companies in distress and a training layoff scheme worth 2.4 billion rand. Government, business and trade unions have signed the National Framework Agreement to combat job losses. Despite this, one million jobs have been lost. Over the years, the South African government has invested billions of taxpayers' money into major purchases and projects. The arms deal, over 80 billion rand. Chow train speed train, over 30 billion rand. The 2010 Soccer World Cup, estimated between 40 to 60 billion rand. Electricity power stations, a projected 300 billion rand. These investments have not led to development that addresses poverty and unemployment. Instead, it has enriched a few government-connected individuals and companies. The impact on government spending, I predict, is going to uh, kick in at some stage. The 2009 round of salary increases in the public service has placed immense pressure on the budget. It will be necessary to moderate salary increases going forward. And the reason for the cuts that the governments argue is that there's been a drop in, in revenue. Uh, the levels of revenue coming in through income tax or company tax or VAT in our case uh, has shrunk. <laughs> The current government of South Africa, it's a capitalist inclined government, yet it is hiding behind the workers, you see. So there's nothing really that can come out in favor of the working class. We're in crisis, we're trying to get cooperation from both government and, uh, and, uh, and business and, uh, and commit them into some concrete things that could be done. To, to cushion the impact of the crisis on South Africa. When we talk about the partnership between the union and the government and the business, those are three different things, you know. Because business people would, would always make sure that they, they defend their territory. Workers mustn't be the one who must pay. So was it worth it uh, signing this thing? And the reality is that uh, it has been borne out by them. It, it is they who pay uh, daily. We are only told that we need to work maybe four hours. Four hours out of three days. You know, you can calculate it's only 12 hours in total when people were subjected to do this thing of a, 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 a layoff. Then really adversely affected their, their salaries. Because I still remember when <laughs> Uh, I got an amount of 2,000 rand, you know, out of 7,000 rand, you know. The fundamental question for us was, if you increase these volumes but you destroy buying power because you retrench workers on continuous basis, who is to buy the, the very same product that you are actually producing? That is why when this crisis hit us, which was a financial crisis, we actually it was quite clear for us to, it was very simple for us to define it as a capitalist crisis. The labor leaders have not really fought against retrenchments. Um, in no country around the world, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and not in South Africa really either. The new minister, for example, of finance uh, have broken the ranks with the uh, non-negotiables. We agree with Kosato. I'm sure all of you do. And the Holy Cow's uh, approach. Now exploring seriously 
the, the calls that we have been making for ages in the, since the 15 years. As required by the Constitution, the bank should pursue its mandate independently. Mr. Speaker, I wish to confirm that the Reserve Bank will continue to pursue a target of CPI inflation of 3 to 6%. I've been very strongly opposed to uh, 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 rigid inflation targeting uh, in all countries. And I think that the crisis uh, is in part a result of central bankers focusing excessively on inflation. What has government done to us up to now? They have lied to us in, in 2007. We agreed on certain things in 2007, then they turned around. Government must intervene to save jobs. No country has industrialized successfully and, 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 and grown successfully without active state intervention. Because despite the fact that the capitalist for all these years have always championed an agenda of no state intervening in the economy. When their profits were now affected, they became the champion of a state intervention. Capital, capitalism is far more regulated in the first world than it is in the third world. To some extent, some of the trade unions are still flirting with the idea of can we do this in partnership with government, in partnership with our bosses. At some point, we take positions that in the eyes of hardcore advanced detachment of the working class could be viewed to be reformist. But I mean, our primary responsibility as a prime mass organization is to defend workers. Uh, the fundamental question that was asked by the, employee, by the employees was that if the government had got what they used to talk, uh, call bailout, so keen in bailing out the companies instead of bailing out the workers because the workers are making the companies. The economy of the country depends solely on the workers. You know. This global crisis leads to worsening poverty and increased inequality, with lower living standards, more crime, violence and desperation by working class people to survive. We are seeing more corruption in state resources directed to private interests, which means less delivery of services to the majority of people. It seems to me one of the things that one, one finds when one gets to South Africa is you feel you're caught in a time warp because the, 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 the leadership seems to be talking in terms of policies that went out of date in 1998. And, and, and most of the rest of the world understands that they don't work. A much more radical change is needed. And there I do think that especially the metal workers and the Kasatu Central have done well by making big demands. For example, demanding that there not just be a change in personnel at the Reserve Bank because they did get rid of Tito Mboweni. I think there has to be a sense in which people have to say, I mean, to say to, to capitalists in South Africa uh, that, uh, you know, we are going to have to impose some of these restrictions on you and you are going to have to take it, okay? That's, that's I mean, you have to put it out there. There is no other way. But that there be a change in policy and a much lower interest rate. Now, when they get a lower interest rate, likewise, they're going to have to get exchange controls because if you lower the interest rate quickly, decisively, then financial capital will run away. So you need to keep them in with the financial RAND type exchange control, one that we've had, one that many countries adopt. The most sustainable form of growth that they can experience is to increase the capacity of their own populations to consume, create a market, put more money into the pockets of these people, create more opportunities at home, and allow them, allow increasing consumption of their own people, particularly their poor people, to power their recovery. Crash trained people as bricklayers, plumbers, electricians, and so on. Then put the unemployed to work, for example, to solve the housing crisis. There's a huge backlog of something like 2.2 million homes. To me, the most exciting opportunities would come in green jobs promotion that are really concrete, not just in some abstract way, but think of the uh, solar power potential that we could harness through. Uh, passive solar geysers, so hot water heaters that are heated not with some fancy photovoltaic system but just through the heat of the sun here. Um, and those cost about 10,000 rand, they could be put into 2 million households, lower the pressure on the electricity grid so we don't need to build more coal-fired reactors and do a whole lot for the uh, climate. And at the same time, 15,000 jobs easily created. We just need the subsidies to flow in that direction, not to nuclear or to um, big 2010 stadiums and the Sutu Islands water projects and the Dupi power plants and Cook industrial districts that will never take off. If government is to intervene, in our view, 
um, companies who will be getting loans, as this is what the call that they wanted, those companies must have monitorium on retrenchment. In 2001, during a severe economic crisis in Argentina, when owners abandoned factories, workers began to take over the factories and run them by and for themselves. Similarly, in South Africa, during October 2010, workers of Mine, Line and Tap Engineering in Krugersdorp, just outside Soweto, occupied their factory after worker deaths, and when the owner refused to pay workers' wages, defrauded the banks, stole company assets, and ran away after it was placed under liquidation. Now we are setting an example with this company that the government can and should intervene in the interest of the millions of ordinary workers who are losing jobs, who have been laid off, who have been subject to short times, who essentially they have been made to pay for a crisis of capital. What has been tragic for the, you know, for the, for the working class is that the leadership of the working class movement in this country and internationally have not been having a clear strategy and a program to fight back. In South Africa, we have always supported workers' control and nationalization of the commanding heights of the economy. The radical socialist vision nationalizing the biggest companies of the economy under workers' control is not the same as the call for state-controlled black economic empowerment. I can hear people talking about nationalization, but wrong people are talking about nationalization. This thing of the workers, you know, owning the companies, that's really what we, 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 we were struggling for, you know. Land nationalisation is the only rational form of ownership for a developing country. Um, other countries are much more protective of the alienation of their land than South Africa. Turkey, for example, doesn't allow foreigners to own land more over a certain number of hectares. It's not particularly revolutionary demand saying that, you know, foreigners can't own land. And then you lease it. You lease it, if, if necessary, like in China, you lease 30, 40, 50, but it's leased. And it's leased subject to terms. But the terms are the needs of our citizens come first. But if you go to other countries, we've got um, we've got um, Cuba. Cuba, I mean, workers there and the people who even know are not working, they do benefit on the socialist states. If you go to Venezuela, there are those countries where we can learn. Now, obviously, to us, it must take another form in South Africa. The big banks, the monopolies, um, come under workers' democratic control and ownership, and the economy is planned not for profit, but to serve the needs of people. Workers are, are, are not in a state of readiness right now. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't consider the question where if bankruptcies actually do occur, but that can only come if there's a, a more strident, a more militant, a more serious kind of uh, leadership that is determined to use every episode in the class struggle and the resistance to the kinds of attacks uh, uh, that the working class faces. Uh, to build the power of the working class, to build its capacity to organize, to oppose all the kinds of questions and raise the demands that expose the bankruptcy of capitalism and the need to go beyond the capitalist system. The Chinese held off nationalizing and actually in many cases it wasn't that they nationalized, it was that because the capitalists themselves did not construct big industry, the state had to do so, which is one of the points that Radik was making. It's not as if there's all these capitalists that are building your industry and they will run away. They never built your industry in the first place. So the state has to do what the capitalists will not do. Influential circles amongst whites in the country and abroad are agitated about our demand for nationalization, not of the entire economy, but of certain sectors which we regard as being important to, uh, in so far as the economy of the country. Nationalization is part of the history of this country. <laughs> How do we ensure that more ordinary people are involved actively in raging against the conditions that they've been forced to live under? Uh, that for me is the, is, is the real alternative. Poverty, penury is very much rife in our societies, you know. But it only needs people who are very much gutsy, very much, you know, uh, strong in terms of standing for the truth in South Africa. The question is no longer how will the capitalist system mend itself, 
and renew its forward thrust. The question is, what will replace this system? What order will be chosen out of this chaos? We, we believe socialism is the future. And we don't believe that capitalism as a system does have solutions for problems that confront humanity. What is the economy? The economy is the way in which a given group of people go about making their living. They do it and they can change.